My parents were Paul Irvin Brockington and Carolyn Sprott Brockington, both South Carolinians, both married until about um, 60th anniversary, and they died 10 days apart in the same room at the same nursing home. It was a very beautiful love story. There were four of us, boy, girl, boy, girl, Paul Irvin Brockington, Jr., Francis Lois Brockington, Joseph Sprott Brockington, and then I'm the baby. <laughs> oh, I think of Miss Ruby at Polly's Island, but under her live oaks, outside with the children playing, eternal recess, but meeting with parents, after school hours, surrounded by children, as she met and had what you and I might call a student, teacher, parent conference. First image is on the grounds of Holy Cross Faith Memorial Church, completely surrounded by happy children. So why don't you think Miss Ruby had her meetings inside? I think that many times there were still children inside finishing homework. Um, perhaps they had not completed their seat work by dismissal. Perhaps it was easier for a parent to come by during the day and meet with Miss Ruby on their own schedule. And I think Miss Ruby always took the time to be with a parent whenever it suited them because she knew it was important. Not just her role as a teacher, but their role as a parent. And there weren't many other meeting places in a one-room schoolhouse. I heard about Miss Ruby before I ever met her and I'm sure that a lot of people were the same way. Um, I had a close family member, Elizabeth Ellis Taylor, who was a volunteer for Miss Ruby. And my father's first cousin, Elizabeth, had a part-time Polly's Island house and would come down but spent her time volunteering while she was on vacation. So that alone was unusual to me, that somebody would be working as a volunteer on vacation. But Elizabeth told me where she was volunteering, in a classroom, and I immediately assumed it was the public elementary school, but she told me it was Miss Ruby's school. And then she told me about what she did there. She played the piano, taught lessons, and of course my cousin was a lifelong educator herself, a Winthrop student. And Elizabeth Ellis Taylor also suggested that I come as a representative of Hobcaw Barony and do a program one day. And so Miss Ruby called me, and of course I said yes. And that's what began my personal relationship with Miss Ruby, was going in to the school to do an outreach program from Hobcaw. Well, beginning probably in 1987, 1987, I began going into the school, and I will probably never forget the very first time that I took a program called Creepy Crawlers. At Hobcaw Barony, we have an education collection of skins and skulls and turtle shells, feathers, bones, and live turtles, live lizards, and a live snake. And I took all these things, and I had discussed probably part of the collection with Miss Ruby before I came. Maybe I didn't mention the live turtles or the live snakes. Maybe. But when I went to the class, it was wonderful. I had room in between the desk and the great big piles of paper, newspaper, boxes, things that were saved and brought. And as we made room in the classroom, pushed the desk back, pushed the tables back, and made a big circle on the floor. And it was so much fun to introduce turtle skulls and to compare their brain cavity to the brain cavity of a dolphin skull. And to talk about the size of the animal doesn't always represent the strength or the brain capacity. We also talked about how animals shed their skin, like horseshoe crabs and snakes. And then we had a chance to bring out a live turtle. Well, the turtle was hilarious, hiding in its shell for so long. Everyone gathered around closely and was interested, and the turtle moved a little bit, and there were shouts of glee. And Miss Ruby was watching all of this and fascinated. And then it was time for the piece de resistance, to bring out the one thing that I knew they would all want to see. And so I turned away to prepare my specimen. I untied the knot, I opened the case, and I drew out a beautiful black and white, non-venomous Eastern King Snake. And I turned around very slowly to greet the students who had previously been in a circle, but now were pushed back and lined up flat against the wall in fear for their lives. 
and I turned to look for Miss Ruby, and Miss Ruby was behind me against the other wall with her arms folded against her chest and her chin tucked down low. And I thought, I can understand that Miss Ruby might be afraid of snakes, but I knew I had an opportunity with these students to change the way they thought about reptiles. So I attempted to draw the students toward me, and when that didn't work, I might step toward them, and that certainly didn't work. So then I realized that in order for those children to think differently, that I would have to get Miss Ruby to touch the snake, to come and look at the snake. And so I very gently got, went over to Miss Ruby as close as I could, and I said, Miss Ruby, I want these students to have an opportunity to touch the snake. And she said, woo, not me, not me, I'm not gonna touch it. And I said, Miss Ruby, don't say I can't say I'll try. <laughs> her motto rang true in her own ears and she unfolded her arms, she put out her finger and she touched the snake and as soon as she did she said, oh, it's not slimy. And then she touched it a little more and a little more and then at that moment as I heard noise behind me I turned and all the students had drawn back away from the wall. They had reformed their circle, sitting cross-legged with their fingers out, ready to touch that snake. And that's when you see not only the influence of a teacher and the example they set, but especially the influence and the example that Miss Ruby set. And every one of those students not only touched the snake, they held a part of it. And I like to think learned a little bit about reptiles that day because of Miss Ruby. I think one of the things that um, was special to me was knowing that the school needed to be restored. And as Holy Cross Faith Memorial Church grew and added members, both black and white, they also saw the need to restore what had been the school, closed in 2000, after Miss Ruby's death in 92, it remained open as a school, as a child care center, but closed in 2000. And so the church did vote for full restoration and it became once again the parish hall as it was before the founding of the school in the early 20th century. And so when the parish hall was restored, it became vital to the life of the church, but also it became a place for community meetings and Miss Ruby's kids the literary program for early readers, preschool children met there several times, and also a place for public programming when we taught about education in the community. And I think one of the most special moments in that building for me was in 2014 when Georgetown County inducted Miss Ruby Forsythe into the, the Women's Hall of Fame for Georgetown County. We had um, the family of Miss Ruby and her one son, Burns Forsyth attend and after we had the ceremony and after he spoke to the group assembled with warm rich full memories we told him that the school the parish hall would be open and would he like to step over and he not only came over and looked around but he also opened up and then began to tell his memories not only of the school but he took all of us upstairs where now there are offices for the rector and for administrators, but he told us how each room was used and when he was a child living there with his father and with his mother, where they sat and ate, but especially where they sat and read together. First how she read to him, later how he read out loud to her, and then how they curled up in different places in each room and read themselves simultaneously. And I think the church appreciated knowing that, and I know everyone that had come to the ceremony and come back over to that building appreciated that time with Miss Ruby's son, her only child. Well, I think one of the things that um, has important, been important in our family all my life um, my great aunt was Mary Gordon Ellis, and my great aunt um, was a school teacher, originally from Williamsburg County, went to teach in Jasper County, and as she taught, she realized the only way she was going to make a difference was 
through the school board by funding, and she was challenged each step of the way. She eventually ran for school superintendent and won, much to the amazement of the men of Jasper County. And then she realized that the superintendent's power was limited by the Senate. And so she ran for Senate. She defeated the former school superintendent for that position. And she ran on a platform of education, and not just education, but equal education for all. Introduced bills repeatedly for the first black busing and was able to create um, awareness of the needs, not only in Jasper County, but throughout South Carolina of not just black students, but all students. Because of that, we grew up with a heightened awareness of how important education was and also an awareness that we could support public education, but also respect private education. I'm a graduate of Columbia College, single gender, private school, liberal arts, studying the humanities, but also to be able to have a choice and still to support public education for those who choose that route. At Pauley's Island, in preparing for a lecture on rural education, especially highlighting Miss Ruby and her work at Holy Cross Faith Memorial Church, I began to study the Rosenwald schools and their impact on South Carolina. 5,000 Rosenwald schools created in the Deep South by Julius Rosenwald, but there were two in Georgetown County. And even as I was two hours away from presenting my lecture at Pauley's Island, at Holy Cross Faith Memorial, I discovered that one of those two schools in the county was at Pauley's Island. And I picked up the phone and I called South Carolina Department of Archives and History and I said, where at Pauley's Island was it located? And it was great to discuss on the telephone and then to go online and read with the information that's online that not only was it at Pauley's Island, it was in the Parkersville community where ever since two churches, St. John's and Mount Zion were established there at the close of the American Civil War, education was still taking place. Not only was a Julius Rosenwald school built there, it continued to be used even after it burned. A school was built and opened, utilized as the elementary school until the 70s. And when that brick building was no longer used as an elementary school, it became the Pauley's Island Child Development Center. And on that site, to this day, in various facilities, education of young students is still occurring. It filled me with excitement. And then to go stand at Miss Ruby School and give that lecture to participants, and as many of them left after the lecture, they followed me on a driving tour of Parkersville. And I hope that day that many people became aware of the work that is still being done, not only on the site of Holy Cross Faith Memorial Church, but also on the site of the Rosenwall School in the smaller community of Parkersville at Pauley's Island. When I think about changes in education, I think about perhaps greater opportunities for so many students, but in other ways our opportunities have narrowed because of time and energy and in some cases money. Through my work at Hobcaw Barony, an environmental education site, we do have an opportunity to provide field trips, field studies. The Bell Baruch Foundation was the very first to create environmental educational curriculum in the United States. We began doing education programs in 1979, and we continue today by taking children outside, whether we're taking them to the former Slave Street on the rice plantation at Hobcaw Barony, whether we're taking them to the ruins of a rice mill, into the salt marsh, into the longleaf pine forest. And I think one of the most impactful moments in education was as I stepped on a big yellow school bus and was make, we were making our way as a class back to the site where we would study in the middle of the forest. I was calling out vocabulary words, having students doing their last review before we began our field study. And one boy named Henry was just staring out the window. And I was kind of sassy and I said, Henry, what you see out that window? Why aren't you answering my questions? And I made my way down to his bus seat and he looked up at me, then he looked back out the window and he said, Miss Lee, 
Is this what they call the woods? And that boy had not had a chance to be out in the woods. We know there are a great number of students right here in Georgetown County that have never been to the marsh. They've never been swimming in the ocean. We are beginning to provide greater and greater opportunities, not only through learning in the classroom and the internet, teaching us global issues, to be able to have a pen pal internationally, but still experiential learning, getting out into the environment, getting out onto a historical site and to be able to study. And I think that's something that we need to continue to think about and continue to support. Education is everything, and it begins when they're so very young, opening their eyes, broadening their horizons, just as Ms. Ruby did at a very young age for her students. When I had conversations with Ms. Ruby about her life at Polly's Island, because I was always very interested in living here myself, but especially what did it used to be like, Ms. Ruby often would remind me of what it was like when she first moved here in 1938. And as she said, I was a city girl. I grew up in downtown Charleston. I had opportunities. We had electricity and running water. And by 1938, when Ms. Ruby came, they had just paved and created US 17. The bridge had officially been opened between Georgetown and the Waccamaw River in July of 1935, and Archer and Anna Hyatt Huntington had financed power lines from Georgetown to Brook Green, and those who could afford it could tie on and have electricity, but not many people could afford it. So Miss Ruby said that when she first came to Pauley's Island, and came to live on the grounds of Holy Cross Church. She cried the whole first week. And then as I continued to get to know Miss Ruby, a decade later or so, I heard her say she cried the whole first month she lived here. And the last time I heard her tell that story, she said she cried the whole first year she lived on the Waccamaw Neck. But I think the impact is the same, that it was a different world. Blacks and whites were both poor in the 30s. They worked side by side in the creek gathering clams and oysters. They were close because they shared the same experience. And African Americans living on the Waccamaw Neck, I believe, lived differently from African Americans living in Georgetown. According to those I've talked to, they led a different life. They were close because of geography, because of transportation, and because simply of being in the creek gathering food. Miss Ruby and Doc Lashcott often talked about we helped one another. We helped one another because nobody had anything. No electric lights to speak of, certainly no street lights. And transportation, sometimes it was easy to get a ride back and forth down so-called Highway 17, but it might be with a man and an ox and a cart. It was a different world that Miss Ruby moved to in 1938. When I first met the Santee Cooper man, who was in charge of maintenance on the Waccamaw Neck, he told me about a woman that he helped out on a regular basis. He um, would often go by and check on her, make sure she was okay, that she had lived alone. Sometimes when it was icy, he would go and um, scrape the ice or the snow off of her steps because every once in a while at Polly's Island there was ice or snow and he would be the first one to know about it. And I married that man, Bill Sheehan. It wasn't until years later that I realized it was his relationship with Miss Ruby that was so very special. He grew up in an orphanage and school teachers were the people that he felt closest to when he considered his childhood. And he and Miss Ruby had a bond, as she did with her children, but also with maybe what you'd call adult learners. People that every time they stopped and talked to Miss Ruby learned something as a young student would, but she impacted his life as the Santee Cooper man representing the power company who would come by and check on things. And she always had time to stop and have a conversation, not just the thank you of it, but he said, I learned something every time I talked to Miss Ruby. And that's the amazing thing about teachers who are always teaching. 
It's not just when children are around, but also when adults are around. She supported the parents as they raised their families. She supported them while they were bringing them to school, but what did they need? She would ask what they needed when they were at home, and she never turned away any student who could not afford the tuition at this private church school. No student was ever turned away because of the lack of ability to pay. Ms. Ruby made education available to all people, and as I like to say, regardless of age. On my very first visit to the Avery Research Center, I was intrigued to learn of it having been founded as the Avery Normal School, later well known as the Avery Institute. But as I walked in and talked with the staff there, one of the first things they said is, hello, welcome, where are you from? And I said, well, I'm from Pauley's Island, South Carolina. And they said, oh, we have an Avery School graduate who lived at Pauley's Island for many years. And at the same time, we both said, Miss Ruby. I had just learned that about Miss Ruby and during my visit realized what opportunities she had at Avery and how she remained in Charleston a brief time to also care for her parents, but then heeded the call to come to Pauley's Island and teach. But Avery had never forgotten any of their alumni, including Miss Ruby, but I also was able to share with them that day that we had just created a new nonprofit organization called Miss Ruby's Kids in her honor. And what, what an exciting day for them to know that one of their graduates had inspired yet another initiative, yet another effort at education. I think Miss Ruby was one of the most hardworking people I knew. Dedicated is a word that's used over and over. That's one reason so many honors came to her. But I think she was humble. She knew her job. But perhaps more than anything, she knew her mission. She knew her gifts. And she knew that when she arrived at Pauley's Island in 1938, that she was doing what God intended her to do. And I think that's why for over 50 years she was able to do it for so long as a widow, for so long as a person alone in many ways, living upstairs without her son, as a widow without her husband. But I think she knew her gifts were in teaching and she realized she didn't resist what she'd been put on this earth to do. And I think if each one of us can realize what our gifts are and what we are intended to do, or at least what we should do based on our gifts and talents, that it would be a beautiful world Miss Ruby especially um, was dedicated, was honored, but remained humble and simply said over and over, I'm just doing my job.